welcome to Global Minnesota's occasional book club where we take some of the most important new publications from around the planet that are addressing critical international and global affairs issues. We get a chance to talk to the authors and to consider how the work of our colleagues around the planet contribute to our understanding here in Minnesota, across the United States, but really around the planet and how together we're trying to craft and create a new future. Today's publication has a lot of special meaning to me personally. It's The Heroes of Environmental Diplomacy, and it's a book of chapters about the amazing people from all over the planet who recognize an environmental danger, danger to themselves, to their family, to future generations. They recognize that this kind of danger was the kind that needed global action. It needed all of us together to do something about it. They put together a solution at a global level, worked with the institutions, the public and private companies, nonprofits, civil society, United Nations, you name it, and successfully some over many decades of work and some uh, with less time, but certainly great effort, brought about international agreements, environmental agreements that tackled those problems that were facing our planet, our people, both now and for future generations. One of the two authors I had the privilege of working with over the last few years, Felix Dodds, who is uh, author of a number of books about specific activities of civil society within the UN and the global system. I've been a huge fan of his books of history about how the sustainable development goals have come to be, but also he's an adjunct professor in the water program at the University of North Carolina, um, his conferences that I've been privileged to attend and participate in, look at the nexus of water issues with energy and with climate and with food. And he's also an associate fellow at the TELUS Institute. Many of us work closely with them uh, on issues related to climate and global affairs and global environment based in Boston. Felix uh, recently sponsored a reading and public launch of this book at the UN uh, Bookstore in New York. I had the privilege of participating and uh, being part of that. Uh, but that was also uh, had one of the authors of a chapter in this book, Irina Zubsevnik, uh, who is the former official at the United Nations, who now is the director of the Stakeholders Forum on a sustainable future. This is a book of um, many chapters of individuals and Irina wrote about the creation of the sustainable development goals, the idea, how it came along, what happened in the negotiations and in the international arena. And uh, it was a real privilege to have uh, her participation in that launch. And today we're going to focus on both the book itself and on that particular chapter within the context of our Minnesota SDG roundtable. So let me just kick this off by saying I'm interested always in how books come to be and how writing comes to be. Felix, to give us a little background on how this book came to be, and then Irina, I'm going to turn to you and ask you about your process of writing and bleep bringing this chapter to life. Felix, how did this happen? This great book. Um, I was uh, in the final throes of uh, finishing another book called uh, Tomorrow's People and New Technology, which looks at 2030 and how our lives might have changed uh, due to nine disruptive industries. And that book looks at home life, travel, looks at work, education. And Chris Spence, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, uh, rang me up. He says, I've got this great idea for a book. So I told him to get lost because I was too busy <laughs> to do the book. And then he just kept hassling me. And then I kind of thought about it. And I thought it's such a delicious idea, this idea of, in a sense, recognizing heroes, people who've played such a critical role, but often are not, people don't know about them. The role that they've played has been behind the scenes um, and that they haven't become uh, maybe a household name. And so I was extremely interested at um, 
uh, looking at it. And I like the idea of calling it Profiles in Courage because John F. Kennedy was one of my heroes when I grew up. And in a sense, these are the heroes that I've been associated with or had the pleasure to work with um, in the sustainable development uh, world. So it came out of a phone call um, and we put the book uh, together in a relatively short period of time. Um, and the publishers have brought it in at a very competitive price for a, uh, for a publisher that normally publishes uh, academic books. Uh, so the history of the book is, is that. And we were very fortunate to have a series of people who, in many cases, knew the hero that they were writing. I wrote about Morris Strong. With Irina wrote about Paolo Cabrera. Uh, but we also had people who uh, were writing about um, their heroes. Uh, Sidney uh, Holt uh, was written by Patrick. They were close friends. So you're getting not just an academic review. In most cases, you're not getting that. You're getting someone who knew about that person who they were. And the, the idea behind the book is who was this person? You know, what is their personal story? How did they then engage in uh, changing the world? What was the, the issue and, and how did it come about? And then what happened to the issue and then, then after that uh, very important process? Well, it, it was a delicious book. Every chapter was a different kind of person who then had a path and brought about this. And, and I know at the kickoff, uh, there was some discussion of some other possible books where other types of these international and public diplomacy approaches could be um, looked at. But when I got the book, and I think I might have had the first copies in the country, it seems like it, but I went right to the chapter on the sustainable development goals, and that was wonderful. Then I was hooked. And then I had to start from the front and work through it. But Irina, you had the challenge of shrinking a giant campaign and very amazing people into a pretty small, I'm guessing that Felix and the editors had some pretty tight parameters. Give us a sense of how you came to approach this and how you came out with this amazing chapter about so much compressed into a pretty small, pretty short chapter in this book. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mark, and it's great to be here uh, together uh, with uh, Felix. Um, and I was really delighted when, uh, when Felix uh, asked me what I would like to, to write about Paula. Um, and the thing is, you know, uh, at that time uh, in uh, the uh, run up uh, to Rio Plus 20 uh, and throughout until 2015, um, I was working uh, at the uh, United Nations and uh, the uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs where I was working was supporting uh, the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, and uh, the working group on SDGs and the post 2015 uh, development uh, process negotiations. So I was there. But, you know, when I started talking to Paula and when I told her uh, that we would like to, to write uh, a book um, where we would have different heroes and that uh, she would be one for the SDGs, uh, the insight that she shared with me was, was really different. I mean, it, it, made, uh, it gave me a new perspective on the whole process. And I think this is something which is really great about this book because it's not only about the process itself because a lot of books have been written about the process. Felix wrote a book with, with other colleagues on it. There were other colleagues who wrote about it. Paula herself wrote a book uh, about the, uh, the SDGs and how they came about. But this is really a personal story of, of, of somebody who was instrumental in uh, pushing for this idea. And of course, it's not... It's not, it's not about one person. Of course, it is the person was at the right time and, uh, and the right place, and she had the excellent ideas. But of course, it's about also how she forged partnerships about this idea so that they can get, so that the idea got traction and so that they were, uh, so that the sustainable development goals were able to be, uh, to be conceptualized uh, and the parameters, uh, parameters for them adopted in the Rio Plus 20 conference, which took place in 2012. So I think this is a completely different type of, 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 uh, I would say insight when you when you when you see it through the eyes of, of somebody else, uh, 
Um, and uh, uh, as I said, at the book launch, when we had it in the UN, uh, two things that I have uh, personally learned from her was uh, one is that it's worth taking the risks. And the other one is that you have to have disruptive thinking in order to get out of the business as usual. Well, the thing for me that I appreciated in all the chapters, but also at the launch, was that it was a book so much about honoring and thanking and expressing gratitude to these people who put themselves and, of course, their family, their colleagues, I mean, just the, the work process and the um, taking the risk, as you mentioned, the courage. But that aspect of the book, for me, standing there in the UN, had these other, I would say, more existential uh, elements. One was in the midst of this global system, the United Nations and all the different agencies, some people can look and say, oh, it's so slow, it's so difficult to get anything done, and they can be very negative. And you guys produced a book about these wonderful people who got it done. And so, you know, you were in a way saying, yes, it's hard. No, no doubt about it. We use the word heroes. We mean that. But it can get done. These folks got it done. And of course, I think it's almost just pure rhetoric to say the world's been upside down, not just COVID and the war and everything else that's going on, whether it's in Africa or Asia or Europe or wherever, but to have such a positive, affirming, really uplifting publication come out and say, yes, lots of difficult things. This is a chapter about something that was such a threat that somebody said, I've got to devote my life to doing something about it, and something got done. So did you have, when you were working on this, Felix, the idea, and Irina, the chapter, did you have the sense that you were producing something that was going to be an anecdote, a counterforce, a uh, some other, I would say, message or another way of bringing hope, inspiration into the world? Or was it the grind of producing, which a book can be? I, I don't, this was not a grind in any way. It was a labor of love, I think, from the beginning. Because once Chris had kind of put the idea in my head, I could see that it was something that we needed because you know, the world doesn't look very good. We went through a period, particularly after 2016, uh, in the election in the United States, but also the Brexit issues in the, in the UK and the things that are happening with COVID and whatever. We needed hope. We needed something that was going to be much more um, in a way to, uh, to show people that things could change and that people have, can have an impact. I think it was Bobby Kennedy who talked about the role that individuals can play in changing the world and that we all have an opportunity to be part of that. We've seen that with Greta, with the enormous work she did with uh, getting young people engaged in uh, the climate change process. Not all the stories are a lifetime of, of commitment. Uh, if you look at the one on President Obama, it was basically 24 hours uh, that he came in and saved us from, a, uh, or at least put the roots down. The Copenhagen Accord, which um, including myself, was seen as a, a disaster uh, in 2009. Um, but actually, it laid the foundation for the Paris Agreement. It was about the 100 billion that Hillary Clinton had pushed forward. It was about all countries producing uh, their national determined contributions. And without the work that he did in getting that accord together at that particular time, I'm not so sure we would have got Paris because we would have been on a trajectory for the Kyoto 2, which would have been just developed countries reporting. That's, I mean, that's a really important point that you're also linking that some of these things give momentum for the next thing, which give momentum for the next thing. And that is captured particularly in some of the maritime 
uh, the long, long campaign that that Chris so eloquently uh, captured. Irina, did you know you were making something that would give us all that what we needed to get up every morning and do the right thing? Well, I would also call it a labor of love. And I was also privileged that uh, Paula is uh, uh, fortunately around and, and very much in the, in the mix of things. So, you know, spending uh, hours talking to her was an additional benefit that I got from it. But I would think, you know, uh, one thing that, that, that came very uh uh, very prominently across and 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 I'm not and I I was sure I, I was aware of it but I think it came to the fore is that uh, with the process to get sustainable development goals some some basically uh, new uh, it was br breaking new ground because uh, of course sustainable development uh, has been around for for a long time and, uh, and, and, and I also wanted to show with this chapter that it didn't come, uh, that it didn't come out of the thin air in 2015, but that, but that it really, uh, you know, it was, it had a lot of history uh, behind it and that it was uh, important to know about it. But at the same time, sustainable development goals and, and the process, how they were developed, through the working op uh, through the open working group of SDGs was a really an innovative process at the United Nations, because uh, usually uh, when you have um, uh, uh, when you have an agreement to be done at the United Nations, it usually you have member states uh, who go through uh, different iterations of the text, and the text is then adopted uh, with uh, you know uh, uh, everybody's agreement. So this is something which Paula didn't want. Because what she wanted is because she wanted actually to have an agreement uh, on SDGs that were implementable for everybody. And that would cover all aspects of everybody's life, of all humankind, of all the, all the life, that, that every, all the aspects of that life. So what she really wanted was to have an evidence-based process and an inclusive process where everybody... Uh, whether they are member state or stakeholder or UN system or any other organization can have a say in it. And then on the basis of that, you would be able to conceptualize these goals, which are uh, as, they are, uh, as they have been set up to be universal and, and, and really uh, interlinked and covering all aspects of human life. So I think this kind of, of breaking new ground through it as well, and also one other thing what was important was bringing of the two processes because at the UN, there was a process uh, that was uh, like a sustainable development process, which was going through uh, from the Rio to uh, the first Rio in 1992 through Johannesburg and so on in that path. And then you had the other one, which was, uh, which would, I would say uh, was based on the structural economics uh, that was uh, that that started with uh, with the uh, with the development aid with uh, with the uh, uh, the uh, uh, poverty reduction papers uh, from the uh, from the World Bank and going through to the um, Millennium Development Goals. Those were two uh, processes that never touched each other. So with this uh, with the SDGs, these two processes came together. And this is another uh, another groundbreaking thing what happened uh, uh, with with this, and that's what what I, I thought that this was something to show that the UN can break new ground and that it can make the difference. So I think that 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 was something that kept me going. Yes, well, I I noticed the evolution of some aspects of the modern information technology was occasionally woven through the story. Felix, was this uh, conscious to say, let's, let's get some of this new tools in there? Or was that just the natural way that the book came together? I, I think it's the natural way the book came together. I think the other thing, at least within, within Chris and my um, initial thinking about the book, is often... Um, People like yourself and Irina and myself, we, we have friends that are not in the sustainable development business, family members who have no idea what we do. 
I mean, it doesn't matter how often we explain what we do. They, they're like, they go glassy eyed and, and um, you know, they just don't understand it. And the book was written in a way I, I, we hope, and I think it has achieved that, which means not everybody could read it, but a, a larger proportion of people will understand how intergovernmental processes work by taking that individual and taking them through their story as a person. Um, I mean, I did Maurice Strong, and you know, Maurice Strong was born in the Great Depression. He forged, he, he transformed his uh, passport to indicate that he was uh, four years older than he was to try and fight in the war. He he went on freight trains to try and get to uh, to Vancouver. He stowed away in a boat, and so we tell the stories about the people, and I think that helps. I think get to a much larger audience. Uh, than uh, previous books. I mean, uh, Irina said I wrote a book on the SDGs, and it's great for those who are doing the SDGs, but it's not that accessible to normal people. I think this book is accessible to normal people to understand what these processes are and why it's important that individuals, you know, get some recognition for the role that they play. Well, so some of them let my imagination run wild of Hollywood movies. Maury Strong stories is one, but of course that's that's an incredible story, right? But um, is there an aspect of the globalization experience? And in in this case, they were chosen. I'm sure there were chapters that were left out and chapters that might come in the future. But did you have a sense that some of this could, in fact, evolve into an ever larger story that could make it then into mass media and maybe give some, you know, occasionally we've seen that. But or were you thinking some of this just might break through, break out? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we have a TV company that's done a deal with Rutledge for um, promoting six of the chapters as a possible set of documentaries. And in fact, they were trying to get me last night, but that was great. Fun. I was at a, uh, the cinema watching the League of Super Pets. So I didn't, <laughs> answer, didn't answer the, uh, the call. Anthropological uh, stir study. Great. Well, that's really good news. And how does that feel to you? Was that fun? Well, the, the League of Super Pets. I, well, I no, yes. it, it wasn't as good as I'd hoped. But. Okay. But what about these other potential chapters? So, I mean, so I, I mean, one of them would be uh, on Paolo Cabrera because um, yeah, the SDGs are so important. Um, if we can get into other media to be able to share those stories, and people like stories, I think that's the other thing. It's a very attractive way of engaging people. And so we're, we'll be pitching to the, uh, to the streaming services in the autumn, I think. Um, and if we're successful, hopefully it will be out for 2024. I don't think it will be out for 2023. Well, that is good news. I know the, the book King Leopold's Ghost, which was ostensibly really about the, the genocide in the Congo when Prince Leopold was in owned it in the colonial sense. But what I remember in the book is that it described the really the birthing of the first sort of kind of highly organized global movement to stop that genocide. And so for me, that part of that story, the horribleness of the of the genocide was certainly clear and all of that. But to hear about all these different people and authors like Conrad and others and I'm guessing that that might be the secret to this book's, you know, success is the storytelling that then was connected to an impact that then was connected to something that people feel deeply was not going in the right direction, whether that's, you know, whatever the particular was. But it feels like um, that was a policy, not a policy in a political sense, but making it storytelling. And then Irina was just describing like how writing the story, she learned new parts of that story. It seems like um, this could be uh, just a good example that then other people could follow. Because we've also had, 
you know, in the health area, we've had some very important, uh, you know, international public diplomacy uh, successes, whether it's infant formula and things in tobacco, et cetera. But um, I'm not uh, uh, done because it, Christmas is coming up in a few months, handing out these books because they'll ship them to you in sixes and twelves. And one of the fun part is... I can think about one chapter that is really in the wheelhouse of a friend. And, and I say, read chapter 12, you know, just ignore the rest or read chapter six, you know, and they always say, I read six. It was fantastic. Then I was hooked. I read the whole book. And I think there's some genius in the way you folks put this together, Felix. And um, uh, I know for me, it's finding those things that you, like you mentioned, that can help explain how this international system sometimes works. You were there and you were around that UN system for that wonderful launch. Give me a flavor of how you've experienced other people discovering the book or asking you about it or commenting on it or book reviews. Um, both of you, uh, friends, uh, family, but but others. Is it uh, picking up a buzz? Irina? Well, um, I hope so. I mean, uh, as, as, as Felix has said, uh, you know, people like to, to read human stories. Uh, and, and also uh, for many people who were around, uh, like I was, you know, reading this, was also a revelation on some things and say, oh, we didn't know it took so much. You told me that, Mark, that you didn't know that it took so much, it was so complicated in the background what was happening uh, and to, to, to deliver uh, the SDGs. Um, and then there were other people, you know, who were saying uh, different things, you know, so, um, and, 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 and also, as you say, they, it, for, it, they started reading one chapter because they were more interested in one area rather than another. But then when they saw how the chapters are really, it, it's a delicious reading. It's really, it really reads well. Then you, you really get hooked up. And, and I myself, the same thing happened to me, you know. Um, uh, Felix shared that his chapter on Maury Strong even before the book was published. And I read it and then I couldn't wait for, for other chapters to, 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 to be available uh, to, to read them. Uh, because uh, it really uh, is, is, is giving you some different insights. And, and, uh, and I would also say this book would be really uh, it's very uh, uh, approachable to, to people who don't know what sustainable development is and are not in that in that area and they can try to understand. And it also shows that it really gives, I would say, uh, to everybody, but especially to a young generation, that they, they can start doing things for themselves and start from themselves and that they can make a difference. So, you know, it gives, uh, it, it, it gives you the stories of people who didn't know that, that, that they would end up where they did, but because they wanted to do something and, and they had an idea which was strong enough for them and they persevered, uh, that's where they, they ended up. So I think it is for everybody to understand that we really can start from ourselves and, 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 be, and make a difference and make the change. I mean, I, uh, I think that um, you know, the, the different stories are really interesting. Uh, so, you know, I have someone like Ralph Estrada, who was the chair of the Kyoto Protocol, you know, d achieved an enormous amount, even though the U.S. had agreed that it wouldn't be able to sign or ratify the Kyoto Protocol because of the hundred votes in the Congress again or in the Senate against it. Um, came back as because he was the um, ambassador to for Argentina to uh, China comes back to um, uh, to Argentina and gets demoted uh, to the driver um, for delegates attending the next COP because his government didn't agree with what he had done as the chair of the COP. So you've got these kind of really interesting stories, some of them very uh, powerful. You know, with Morris, no one knew what he was doing on the stakeholders. I interviewed, you know, his former deputy, Nitin Desai, I, Yolanda Kakabaxi, who'd been in charge of the, the major groups process at Rio. 
No one knew what he was doing. And here you had a, a man who had not only was the Secretary General of the Rio Conference in 92, but the Stockholm Conference in 72, where he recognized that people, the governments did not deliver on what they said they would do. And so his whole idea was to expand the stakeholders to enable other people to take up the cause uh, because he didn't trust the governments to do it. Now, did anyone know he was doing that? No, he pretty much kept that to himself. But he played such an important role. Those nine chapters in Agenda 21 have basically changed the international arena and have given space for indigenous peoples, uh, for young people, for women. Uh, and that's really important. And, you know, the, the difference between a stakeholder uh, approach and a civil society approach is civil society reduces space for women and young people, while a stakeholder approach recognizes uniqueness of women and young people and indigenous peoples to have their own space to be able to put forward their own process. And I think that was a really important role and and the only person who probably knew what he was doing was chip linda who at that time was running the center for our common future but i think between them they played such an important role in helping to craft the international governance process that we now see so i wonder how those of us who are excited about the book but also just about the kind of breakthrough and the way that it is shaping our ability and our thinking, how do we use it to really put our finger on the side of the scale of stakeholder and involvement? I mean, you know, it's been COVID, we've been isolated, there's all this and that and whatever. We're about to go into uh, a UN General Assembly. People will be watching this video for years, so we can't be too specific, but there's just a lot happening how do we who care in this regard take this book and figure out how it helps to be fuel to the fire, how it helps to bring some of those other um, elements out? Ideas that you've had, uh, sparks of, oh, that would be a good way to approach this? I mean, Irina. You go first now. So I, 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 I'm not sure that we thought more than we have as far as trying to get it into a TV series, which would get to a larger group of people. Right. Now, if we do that, then what we'll do is um, clearly produce a website to support the book. Uh, we're also at the moment looking on whether to do podcasts for each of the chapters themselves and have each of the authors have an opportunity to talk about their, uh, their hero. Um, I would hope that the book would be picked up by libraries and by universities because I think it does it does demystify a lot of the intergovernmental process uh, by focusing on the individual and enables people to understand that change can happen and and some of them are long. I mean, you use Sidney Holt uh, as an example. I mean, you know, he was doing it over the whole of his lifetime. From I think. Um, when he was from the 1940s onwards, and he played different roles at different points to move the needle because no one wanted to stop killing the whales because uh, there was a financial benefit. Uh, we were using whale oil for so many things in those days that we didn't appreciate um, how they were sentient be beings. Some of them were quicker, you know, so the Obama thing, it's a 24 hour. He came, he, he rushed into a room where China, Brazil, and India were meeting and managed to get craft a deal. He left before they had actually even presented it to the UN. So, mm. you know, you've got these different kind of things. You've got um, the ozone uh, convention, uh, the Montreal Protocol. We, we look at um, Mustafa Tolba. Mustafa Tolba, uh, I would say, we call him the Egyptian king uh, in the chapter, and we talk about him in a sense, he was a bit of a bully. You know, he would bully governments to get them to agree. And without that bullying, we probably wouldn't have got the Montreal Protocol. But it had a repercussion for him because when it came to Rio in 92, the logic would have been for UNEP to act as a secretariat. But 
he had used all of his political muscle and governments were not going to give him that position. So he lost the opportunity to, uh, to in a sense, be the Secretary General for Rio because of the way he had pushed them on climate change, on biodiversity, but also uh, on the Montreal Protocol. Well, so, uh, go ahead, Irina. No, I, 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 uh, no, I fully agree with what what uh, what Felix was saying, but um, I maybe take another another take on it, um, and that is that uh, because you asked about the upcoming, uh, uh, you know, events and the general assembly new cycle is starting uh, and all of that, and I think that this book shows that there is uh, there is um, a, a space and a role for all stakeholders uh, at the UN and, uh, and that everybody needs to play a role. And I would like to quote what um, uh, two, two things, two, two different ambassadors, uh, one from Denmark, uh, um, the other from Liechtenstein. Uh, one from Denmark said uh, to, he said, you know, um, the uh, stakeholders uh, and in this sense, he meant more uh, in excluding member states, but other stakeholders should really uh, use the intergovernmental processes for their benefit and not fight them. And the other one was uh, Ambassador from Liechtenstein, who said that uh, the, uh, the 2030 agenda and SDGs is the best agreement that UN has reached in years. So, you know, having these two things in mind, I think it's very important and that this book can show how stakeholders can really engage uh, and, 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 and that the, uh, and what is, uh, and all of these uh, processes and agreements, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Montreal Protocol and Ozone Layer and, and, and many others, that they actually contributed to, uh, to, 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 to really get where we want to be in a better world. And so the SDGs in today's uh, uh, world, which is so, uh, uh, you know, I would say fraught with so many uh, difficult geopolitical um, uh, trends and situations and conflicts and everything is really a blueprint for recovery. It really gives you something that you can, you know, if you are a policymaker, if you are working in the government, or, or if you are in the private sector or civil society or wherever you are, uh, that you can really have it as a blueprint and, and, and really use it. And that, I think, gives hope that, that, there, is, uh, that there is a really, um, uh, uh, I would say, a merit in doing what you are doing. And, and, and that there is a hope that we can, if we really work together, you talked about globalization, I would say uh, the network, network a network uh, multilateralism and uh, and global solidarity is something that that can give us hope and that we have to strive for and this book i think goes into that direction so felix you brought up a kind of a a story within a story <clears throat> that using the bullying and using the, all of the political capital and the push, 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 then had a negative effect not getting this other really powerful position or the government not liking what you were doing in Kyoto. And so you get demoted when you come home. Uh, I, of course, participate in a lot of things around trade negotiations, and I watch little sub chapters of created crisis so that somebody could go back to their government and say, oh, if we don't do this, this is going to happen over here. So I wonder if there is an element of the, the enlightening these stories of also having these more uh, sophisticated, nuanced, more descriptive elements of public diplomacy and stakeholder diplomacy lifted up in uh, more of our conversations and m more of the telling of our history. You you both have observed this up really close throughout your life and careers. I'm wondering if there's a place where you see some of these really juicy, in addition to delicious stories, might have a way of enlivening uh, that understanding of just how important this work is. 
So I think the thing to kind of consider is we've just gone through COVID. Uh, we have in New York, maybe 40% of the government officials have changed in the mission. So we have a new group of people who don't understand the SDGs, basically. Wow. Um, and, you know, there's not, we don't have, uh, though, um, Irina's new organization, Stakeholder Forum, has an idea of trying to do a summer camp for, for stakeholders and governments to explain these intergovernmental processes and what we've got out of them. There needs to be some form of teaching. I mean, our book plays a role, but it, they actually need to be, you know, meeting up with Paolo Cabrero, who can explain what happened, uh, because there's no way that the present people in New York could create the SDGs. Um, right. I think the, the, we were very fortunate, in a sense, by having Rio plus 20, uh, which without it, we would never have got the SDGs. We would have ended up with a MDG plus agenda. Um, and so if you look at the trajectory from when Paolo uh, kind of publicly went forward with the SDGs, which was in July 2011, to the point where we get Rio plus 20 in 2012, which sets up the open working group that Irina spoke about, which then by 2000 and um, the end of 2014 has agreed the SDGs and it's not reopened. That was also the crucial thing, that the SDGs were not reopened for the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. And remember that those 70 countries weren't meant to be 70 countries, but were meant to be only 30 countries. And so, in a sense, there's some very interesting lessons there. But, you know, one of the things that I feel that too often happens is stakeholders don't appreciate the backdrop of global politics at any particular time. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate in 15 and 12 to be coming out of uh, the financial crisis and to have the right governments and people in the right places to be able to get the Paris Climate Agreement and to get the, um, and you know, that's not to diminish the enormous work that Christina Figueroa did as the head of the UNFCCC Secretariat. And if you want to read a chapter about how someone should run a secretariat, um, that is an amazing chapter about yes. her particular characteristics and the way she cared about staff and should be the text that any new head of the UNFCCC, uh, which is about to be announced, I think, should read before going to see that secretariat. But I think all of those are important. But then we're in a very difficult position. We're not making advances now. We're, we're defending uh, previous agreements. We're not in a position where we can kind of move the political agenda forward or even get the accelerated implementation that we need because the world is in a bit of a mess. And that happened after Stockholm. It happened after Rio in 92. It clearly happened around the World Summit on Sustainable Development because of 9-11, particularly in the impact that that had. So real politics is very important behind the scenes to see. The advantage of what we did in 2015 is what Irina talked about. We have a blueprint, and that blueprint means that governments and stakeholders are trying to move that agenda forward, irrespective of the disaster that we're having to, uh, to deal with, and that at least gives us hope. And if Irina, you wanted to come in on that. No, except to say that I fully agree with what you have just said. Yeah. Well, so this fabulous book, Heroes of Environmental Diplomacy, you can get it from a lot of online places, from the publisher, from other bookstores online. There's some uh, used copies now in A Books. Um, there's the UN Bookstore. Uh, there are lots of places to get this. But there's also um, this future where there might be podcasts and others. And so I've been thinking some about the way that I can help amplify this. So, for example, trying to get one or two communities to use it as their chosen book for the book of the year. You know, a lot of communities now are doing that. The Foreign Policy Association, who runs this national discussion, the Great Decisions, uh, each year they have you know, in Minnesota, we have about 50 of these groups and 
they're all over the country and they're often dealing with some and some interrelated topics that then they could see. Here's an example of a book, a resource to back up one of those great decisions discussion. Um, but also in the end, there's the whole just getting the word out to those constituencies who care about the individual, you know, the marine issues or the climate issues or whatever, and helping to amplify how important it is to know the history so that we can be better prepared for going to the future. The two of you have made history. You've also been great guardians of history and keeping it alive, but also keeping it clear and honest and, and straightforward. In our last couple minutes, uh, I want to ask you two, as two of my personal heroes, how doing this book changed the arc of your life. Irina, do you want to go first? Well, I think I alluded to it a little bit at the beginning uh, when I said that there are there were two distinct uh, benefits that I got and uh, that I was privileged to to when I talked to Paula, um, and and these are uh, that it really uh, is um, about it's worth taking a risk, uh, and you can read the book to see what risks she she took uh, to 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 do what what she did. Um, and and then the other one uh, is uh, disruptive thinking, and that you really uh, it really and this goes together, I think, uh, because uh, it really shows you that uh, that in order for uh, things to make to make it happen, uh, as as Paul often says, is is very important. And I would like to finish with maybe one thought uh, for uh, for the uh, for those who will be listening, um, and that is the uh, we are going to have next year uh, in 2023 in September uh, the 2023 SDG Summit, so Sustainable Development Goals Summit, and everybody uh, should be part of it. And, and should contribute uh, to uh, to uh, what uh, Felix was said uh, that we need acceleration and we need implementation. So um, everybody can be part of that uh, process and of that story, if I may say that. So I think this is something which uh, which uh, which uh, everybody can 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 listen in. And I, and that was and and that was what going on to what uh, Paula said um, at the meeting we had in July, the high level political forum, sustainable development to make it really happen. We have a blueprint. We have the SDGs. Uh, we really need the accelerated actions to make it happen. And that can be uh, any one of us can contribute to that. And that's what I have learned. And uh, I'm really um, a very uh, privileged to, to have been part of, of this uh, whole uh, effort and, and hopefully continue still spreading this story. Thank you. Um, I would just build a little bit on that to begin with. I think that the important thing about the midterm review, in a sense, or the, the, the midway through the SDGs at the Heads of State Summit in September next year, is we need to get people not to think of the summit, but to think of the summit in 23 leading to the 27 summit, which will be the next time heads of state meet. And what are they going to do between 23 and 27 to make that accelerated implementation part of it? Now, as you mentioned earlier, Mark, I've written a number of books on the history. I did the book with Maurice Strong, Only One Earth, that take it, took us from 72 to 2011, I did with Liz Thompson and uh, Jorge Laguna from RIA Plus 20 to the New Development Agenda, which looked at uh, the RIA Plus 20 conference, but then also the one on the negotiating the SDGs with Ambassador Donahue and Hamina. And to some extent, this is part of that history thing, is to make the, to have the stories about how we have got here or how we have not in certain cases, how we've gone off in different directions, that that is there for people to use as references. And I think for me, you know, if this becomes a TV series, I think this is the best opportunity I, um, of all the books that I've done to try and actually uh, engage with um, the general public in a way that uh, the books by themselves will not be able to do.
Great. Thank you so much to both of you for being with us for this program, but for making this book come into being and for crafting your chapters and bringing all of us together around the launch of this, but also the promotion of this into the future. And I'm super excited about thinking about the 2023 uh, SDG Summit. And also, of course, we're trying to bring a World Expo to Minnesota in 2027 on the SDG. So lots of things. But the book gives us a full rainbow of different examples. And as you both pointed out, there's lots of things in there to maybe catch somebody's eye or attention and then to bring them through the doorway into that's much bigger. So I look forward to seeing you both again. Uh, I look forward to finding other ways. I look forward to um, introducing ourselves to the larger world if it happens in that TV and and uh, the digital. But today we've gotten a chance to really see how this book is uh a game changer. And I'm just really uh, grateful for you to have created that and for you to join us today. Thank you again. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.